My name is Tom Holden, and uh, today we're going to discuss the uh, wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. Uh, Lake Superior is the most famous shipwreck and probably one of the most famous for all of the Great Lakes. The accident itself happened uh, really quite a while ago, back in 1975. On November 10th, really bad storm. The ship was lost with all hands. No one left to tell the tale, and so there's a lot of mystery about this shipwreck. And also with uh, Gordon Lightfoot's ballad, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, there's music to go with it. So it's kind of kept in memory both ways. And also the crew members, 29 people went down with the boat, many of them from this area, uh, Ashland, Washburn, Bayfield, Superior, up at Silver Bay, Minnesota, Duluth, Minnesota. So um, it has a lot of uh, local interest closer than in many other places around the Great Lakes. This is just a typical bulk freighter drawing. It just shows the main parts with the, the pilot house up forward. You had two non-watertight bulkheads, so compartments with three or three cargo holds. They wouldn't do this, but for some reason they could load, say, limestone in the stern section, coal in the middle section, and uh, iron ore in the forward section. And the, even in really rough weather, those cargoes would never mix. They would stay in each bulkhead. They were called non-watertight bulkheads because down at the bottom of these really almost solid steel walls, there were little openings that would allow the water from the forward part to slowly make its way back through the these scuppers in the bottom toward a, a suction area at the stern of the cargo hold to pump the water out. And up on the deck, the hatch covers, there were 21 hatches. Then uh, you'll see there's a, a little vent covers. We'll talk about those and where the lifeboats are at the stern of the ship. And looking at the, the ship, kind of like a loaf of bread, then we'll open up our, our loaf and look at one slice. And what we've got is the hatch cover in the middle. Um, it sits on a hatch combing, just a short little wall. Alongside that, but under the weather deck, are tunnels which allow the crew to move from one end of the boat to the other inside out of the weather and then the cargo hold which is kind of hopper shaped in the middle and then they have ballast tanks on either side and then there are bottom ballast tanks so when the boat is without cargo you can put water in there and let the boat ride lower in the water and ride more comfortably there's several pictures we'll show here the, uh, during the construction and unlike many vessels or our kind of common understanding of building a, building a ship is you lay down the keel first and then put the frames up and then put the hull on. Well, in this case, this was a modularly built boat. There were a lot of pieces that were prefabricated and then brought over to the actual construction site. So what we see here kind of on the right hand side of the picture um, there's some men standing there in white hats or white shirts on. Those people right there are standing on a section of the keel that's actually in the middle of the boat, and that's where it was started. This next view shows another one of those modularly built sections. This one happens to be a piece of the bottom inside the cargo hold. The underneath, the dark shaded area underneath there, goes down on the inside of the water bottom, welded there. And then on top of this piece would be the cargo bottom where the iron ore, taconite, coal, whatever would sit. You can see some other sections welded together to form that inner bottom. You can see the openings cut through for the ballast water in the bottom. This next piece, and I think this one's really important, this is the side ballast tank. There are 16 to be an even number that were built. They're identical on both sides of the ship. And they were just built before the actual assembly of the boat in a way. I have always thought, well, they're built on exactly the same plans, built from the same material, built by different people at different times, uh, hot days, cold days, some days when you're happy, some days you're sad. These are all identical, but not exactly. And one of the things they always say in the shipyard is, if it doesn't fit, make it fit. So if these were off by a half inch, not too bad. You could make them shift around and weld them together just fine. You could put the same piece on the right-hand side or on the left-hand side, and you could get them to match up. But if you had enough mismatches, 
that might have done something in the overall long-term history of how the boat operated and how it was maintained. In this view, we can see they've made a lot of progress in, in the construction of the ship. On the left-hand side on the bottom and the right-hand side on the bottom, we can see those same two pieces that we saw in the previous photograph with the side ballast tanks and the bottom ballast tanks. Uh, the men inside are standing on top of the, the cargo bottom. On the right-hand side, above the piece that we looked at separately, I'll refer to that as being stick-built. That's the area where the tunnels are, where people would move inside the ship from one end to the other. And those are not modular. They're being built in place one piece at a time. Two different styles of construction. Still, it's an all-welded boat and things were made to fit maybe pushed into place a little bit on the lower part and on the upper part they were welded or in place they were, they were fitted to be in place here the ship is uh, the hull at least is complete and this is an important part for the shipyard because once the hull is launched it actually gets into the water a lot of money changes hands in the shipyard so we want to get the hull in the water even though the ship is not completed Mrs. Fitzgerald launched the boat and broke this bottle of champagne over the bow and then the process of getting the boat into the water began. It was kind of a struggle for this boat. It was a little harder than usual, but you can see that when it came down the slides of the ramps on the right hand side and huge splash as it uh, washed across the slip and then back again and across the slip with such speed and tension on the ropes and the chains that held it that it actually damaged seven or eight plates on the side of the ship which had to be replaced before it was ready to sail on this photo we see the and more of a width the whole width of the the slip that it went into and the boat is really far over the shipways you can still see there and the cranes that were used to maneuver the pieces into place of those uh, sub assemblies in this view, we're much further along. We're just about ready to go out for sea trials. The pieces are all in place. The hatch covers are laying between the decks. You can see right in front there down at the bottom, the number two, then hidden by the hatch crane is number three hatch, then number four, five, six, and seven, all the way to 21 back at the stern. So when it is complete and we head out for sea trials, there are a number of things that are done there where they push the engine to get up to maximum speed and kind of slam it down in reverse or come to a complete halt. They do a hard wheel to the right and hard wheel to the left. So there's a lot of maneuvering and testing and whatnot. Well, one of the things that Raymond Ramsey the superintendent of construction at the shipyard, one of the things he thought was the boat was going to be for its length, it was going to be kind of squirmy or squirrely. If you got into certain sea conditions, he thought it would, would twist or torque along its length. He thought it might spring up and down, kind of like a diving board. He thought that it might bend in certain sea conditions, bend to the left or the right, to the extent that it might not straighten out before a next large wave hit it and caused that to happen again. So there were things that he was concerned about. Although he wasn't really part of the sea trials, he did get to go on board. He took measurements and what he had anticipated was the way the boat was. So it had some issues in its design, perhaps in the construction, possibly with the materials that were being used but uh, mostly in the original design. The boat is uh, 729 and a half feet long, 75 feet wide, and most Great Lakes boats kind of keep that dimension ratio. Whatever the length is, the width is about one-tenth of that. So let's say it's 730 feet long, then we'd say it was you know, should be 73 feet wide, but this is just a little bit wider at 75 feet. What we see on the deck here now is the, the hatches are in place, the hatch covers, all of the hatch clamps are up, those little straight little lines that stick up from the covers. And those are called Kestner clamps. They're a patented clamp and they're kind of like a, a latch on an old steamer trunk where it's flipped up into place and then a, a tool that's a, kind of a lever with two fingers on the end of it is used to snap that down in place. Since these were invented in the 1950s, no one has ever had any problem with them. So that is the industry standard. It was then in 1958 when the boat was built, and it is still the standard hatch cover for 
the one-piece hatch covers. Following sea trial, she was ready for her first upbound voyage from the Detroit area up through the rivers up to Silver Bay, Minnesota, where it took on its first cargo. And of course, it was a steam-fired boat, steam turbine, and coal-fired. So it needed to load up its coal for fuel before uh, completing the, the upbound journey. Here she's uh, pretty spiffy looking right here. Uh, hardly a mark on the boat. Same in this view, upbound light. The company that, that operated the boat was not the one that had it built. It was built by Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance Company, insurance company headquartered in Milwaukee. The head of that company is soon to retire. At that time was uh, Edwin Fitzgerald and his family, some of his ancestors, had been deeply involved in the shipping industry as vessel owners, uh, vessel repairs, own uh, cargo docks, warehouses, ship captains, all kinds of stuff. And he hadn't had his chance yet. So he convinced the, the board of Northwestern Mutual Life Insurance to invest in building a boat, just like another company might invest in building a, a high rise office building as a company investment. And they were pretty shrewd about it because before they ever had the boat started being built, it was already leased out for 25 years. And it was a bare boat charter. So all they had to do was provide the boat, the paint colors, the fuel, the crew, the food for them, the cargoes to haul. All of that was the responsibility of the manager. And this boat was uh, operated by Ogilvy Norton Company. They're the ones who did all of the manning uh, of the ship and its maintenance and whatnot. The man in the middle of the photo with a straw hat there is Mr. Fitzgerald. And this is perhaps the only time it visited Milwaukee, where the insurance company was headquartered and where Mr. Fitzgerald lived. It wasn't on the regular route. There were no iron ore docks in Milwaukee. Its normal run was from up on at Silver Bay on Lake Superior down to Toledo, Ohio. So this was just a tourist stop done specifically so Mr. Fitzgerald could show off his namesake vessel. You see Silver Bay up on the North Shore. So Silver Bay to Toledo in the lower right. And on our last trip, it was really from Superior through the Sioux Locks down to Zug Island at Detroit was where they were going. Still carrying iron ore, taconite iron ore. Its last trip, it loaded up 26,116 tons of cargo, which has been of some interest because that's more than the boat was designed for. But during the course of its career, the load line or the amount of exposed hull on the side that uh, was allowed by the Coast Guard was made shorter so it could load more deeper in the water and that was done three times and each time that was a privilege that was earned they had to do something to the fitzgerald to beef it up because everybody knew that loading deeper meant that it was going to be more water on deck a wetter vessel and so among many things that were done were the reinforcing of the hatch covers and those hatch covers were originally designed to withstand the weight of four feet of water just sitting on top of them. So if you went to five feet in theory, you could have caved in a hatch cover. Over the course of those three changes in the load line, the hatch covers had to be really beefed up. They not only had the original four feet of, let's say, safety factor, they had to build in 425% more safety factor. So on top of the original four feet the, the hatch covers could hold, there was an additional 17 feet of water they could hold. So now, in theory, they could hold 21 feet of water on top, or if you got to say 25 feet or 30 feet, and particularly with waves in motion and all of that force, you could possibly cave in a hatch cover. And we'll see toward the end here that um, that's one of the things that I'm pretty sure actually happened was to cave in a hatch cover because there's a couple that sit on the wreck standing up in the cargo hold in the hatch opening. So those were caved in from the outside while the boat was on the surface. So eventually hatch cover failure is going to figure into what happened. Many trips up and down through the Sioux Locks, trips on Lake Superior 50 or more times per year. Uh, always the same trip, Silver Bay to load up, Toledo to unload, back again, Silver Bay to Toledo. 
It sounds horribly boring. What a what a, a boat to be on. But it was really a boat that was sought after by many of the crew members. And one of the reasons, of course, was it was brand new. It was the biggest, it was the fastest, carried the largest cargoes. But also because you knew that they were going to Silver Bay, say every week and going to Toledo every week. If you had family in the Silver Bay area, you could trade your watch or your four hours uh, on duty with another crewman and get eight hours at least off where your family could come up and you could visit with them once a week, something that was unheard of. Of course, as any boat, it needed repairs now and then, not for really big accidents, but a lot of times just uh, the wear and tear. One of the things that was uh, always vulnerable with the unloading equipment was having the helit unloaders, big clam bucket machinery, smack into the hatch combing and dent it or maybe crack it a little bit. And then when the hatch cover sat down on it, it wouldn't be watertight. They might still be able to close it, but it might not be truly watertight. And every five years, the boat would go in for its regular Coast Guard inspection. So on Sunday, November 9th, 1975, we loaded up at Burlington Northern Ordock in Superior. And this is the, the Superior entry in the Ordocks behind there. 26,116 tons of cargo. And the way they loaded the boat was not with a real scientific plan, but a plan that had been worked out by the first mates on the ship. And it was a simple thing as to how much ore to put in the boat. What they'd do is they'd load a certain amount, so many chutes from the dock into the middle section of the boat and let it sag a little bit in the middle. And then they'd load some taconite at the back of the boat at the stern and to kind of start to straighten it out. And then they'd load at the front of the boat and really straighten it out. Then back to the middle, back to the stern, back to the front. So all the time what's happening in that middle section is going up and down or more down and then straightened out. So it's working the middle section a little bit. If your goal in life was to be a, sh a shell plate or a steel part of the ship, you did not want to be in the real belly of the boat because you were always being worked and worked hard bending and whatnot. And sometimes those welds between the outer skin of the ship and the inner bottom would break loose. And so at least every five years, there were repairs to the inner part of the boat. That was one of the sources of the so-called wiggling thing and the idea or the concept of a loose keel because um, th those welds would break and they'd have to repair them in the shipyard. In our story, um, there's really two boats involved. There's many that will become involved, but the Arthur M. Anderson is the second boat. Very similar to the Fitzgerald, meant to carry taconite cargo from various harbors and sometimes limestone and coal to various destinations on the lower lakes. Owned by a different company, U.S. Steel, the Arthur M. Anderson was a little bit different in that she had been built at 647 feet in length and had been lengthened the winter before 1975. So over the winter of 1974-75, this ship was lengthened in Superior, Wisconsin at the Fraser Shipyard from 647 feet to 767 feet. So, and the Fitzgerald, of course, had never been lengthened. So if you thought about these two boats and both leaving at one end of the lake and then go loaded and going through a big storm, and one of them is not going to arrive at the other end, probably you would have guessed it was the Arthur M. Anderson that would be the one because she was longer, had two brand new zippers in a way up her, her sides, and just seems like the one that would wiggle and squirm the most and suffer from the storm. But she was a survivor, rode just fine. Captain Cooper on the Anderson was very pleased with this boat before the storm and after. The solid line going across the, the lake here is the road of the Arthur M. Anderson. The dotted line is that of the Edmund Fitzgerald. It says on Duluth as to where it started, but Duluth and Superior are basically considered one port, and the boat really left from Superior entry. They were a couple hours apart on their departure, but both carrying similar amounts of taconite iron ore. When you look at the map where that number two is, we see what's happened is the two boats are out on the lake. The Anderson got a little bit ahead of the Edmund Fitzgerald, but the Fitzgerald was a little faster and traveling to the south and caught up with and actually passed the Anderson. And you'll notice going through that arrow number two, they're headed into the weather. 
And the weather was such that a storm was predicted, but it was supposed to be just a kind of an ordinary fall storm, nothing spectacular, nothing like they ended up with. So we see kind of in the left of the middle there on November 8th in the morning, there's a, a low pressure area. And then that had moved the next morning on the morning of the 9th while we're loading. And then the morning of the 10th, the morning of the actual accident, that low pressure was way up on Lake Superior and actually a little bit northeast of, of Lake Superior. So that storm continued to build and to move and change. And so the weather predictions also did that. They lagged a little bit. Weather predicting in 1975 wasn't as good as it is now. The two masters kept track of the weather. Captain Paquette uh, on the Wilfred Sykes uh, more intensely. Captain Cooper as well on the Anderson. Now, two boats, as they moved up to the middle of the lake between Isle Royale and the Keweenaw Peninsula, they had figured out that if they kept on that course, sort of northeast end of Lake Superior, northeast corner, that they should arrive up there about the same time that the low pressure did. And so they would be in the low pressure in the eye of the storm when they needed to turn down because we're kind of running out of room on Lake Superior. So that's where they were headed, and that worked out just fine. By this time, of course, the Anderson is following the Fitzgerald. They turned down. They made a little adjustments to their courses. Uh, up around Michipicoten Island, a large island in the northern part of the lake, they continued down toward Caribou Island. And before or around Caribou Island, just let's say close to Caribou Island, the two boats had talked to each other, Captain Sorley on the Edmund Fitzgerald and the Captain Cooper on the Anderson. They, of course, were discussing the weather, other boats out on the lake, and was the lighthouse at Whitefish Point working? Was the radio beacon at Whitefish Point working? And whatnot, and they continued on. The Fitzgerald apparently got kind of close to Caribou Island. We don't know if it went through a shoal area, which was described as Six Fathom Shoal or not, but it certainly was close. Just prior to that or at, at that time, it had started to develop a list, causing the boat to lean over to one side. The two boats uh, are talking to one another and continuing on their voyage. The captain on the Anderson received information from uh, Captain McSorley, that at Caribou Island, or just after that, he reported he had a fence rail down, he'd lost two ballast tank vent pipes or caps, and he was taking a list. And to my mind, the only way you can make a, uh, a ship lean over, uh, only two ways really, is to have the cargo ship, for some reason, roll the boat so far that the cargo moves over to one side and then you can't get it to roll back to the middle, which has never happened with a taconite cargo. So that's very unlikely. What's more likely is water is inside the boat, either in one side of the bottom or inside the side tanks or water inside where the tunnel was just above the side tanks. We have to have water on the one side. If water is in the cargo hold, it's just going to settle to the bottom. That cargo hold is kind of a V shape and um, there's no reason for the water to be on one side or the other. This view shows uh, looking down another ship, it's not the Fitzgerald or the Anderson, but we can see that on the left-hand side, we'll see where the fence rail or stanchions are. That was knocked down on the Fitzgerald. We don't know why. The bollard or bit is where it's, you tie up the ship. Um, there was nothing mentioned about those. The next thing, the ballast tank vent pipe or vent cap, those are important. Those are pipes that are often you find them paired within, say, one or two feet of another, one another. And there'll be one on one side, one on the other side of the ballast tank's barrier down below. And they have covers on. The reason for the covers is to keep water from going down through those pipes into the ballast area. There's Pipes are about six inches, sometimes eight inches in diameter. You could maybe, you'd, it'd be really hard to stuff even a volleyball uh, down one of those holes. And the caps that are, were on this boat, the Fitzgerald, were mushroom caps. It's kind of like a little umbrella sitting over that opening, and you closed them up by just spinning that a cap around, and on a threaded bolt in the middle, it went down and secured that so water wouldn't get in there. 
even with a broken away and that, that two eight inch holes right there in the deck for every wave to pour water in that's not much water at all compared to the overall size of the ship and the and the tank so it really made little difference the fence rail being down that's kind of interesting because most of the conjecture is for that to happen would be two things one is something raked across the deck and push them over. Some big log went across the deck, but there's no mention of that at all. And somebody would have had that been the case. What really more likely happened is that the boat was as working, uh, rising up and down in the seas and kind of torquing and twisting and bending side to side, that those fence rails, particularly as the boat hogged up in the middle, those cables, which are three eighths to a half inch in diameter, got really tight, really, really tight. It's unlikely that the cable broke, but the turnbuckles that are used to tighten up the cables probably was the, the weakest link in the system. One of those broke or more of them broke, and that allowed the wire to go slack, the stanchions to kind of bounce up and down and eventually fall over. So you could easily see losing a fence rail due to the boat hogging in, in the storm. Again, we see the um, the top of the two ballast tank vent cover vents, the vent pipes very close together there, one in one tank, one in another tank, side by side. A little bit past Caribou Island, Captain Cooper received information again from Captain McSorley that they had some issues. Their list had continued to increase. Their radar was out, and he told them that he had all of his ballast pumps working. So in theory, he could pump water out of wherever it was on the ship up to a maximum of like 32,000 gallons per minute. A really big number. That's like one or two high school size swimming pools that you can empty every single minute. So it was e it would easily have kept the water out of the ship if it wasn't coming in just as fast or faster than it was being sucked out. The radar is really important because now the Fitzgerald is unable to navigate they didn't know where they were out on the lake. The compass was working fine. They had the direction, they had their speed and whatnot, but they needed the Anderson to provide their location. The Fitzgerald asked the Anderson to shadow them down the lake. And Captain Cooper and his mate both agreed that yes, they had them on radar at the moment and they would continue to provide information. By now we're down in the area around five, six on the map. We have the damaged Fitzgerald, we have the Anderson following, we have the Fitzgerald slowing just a little bit, trying to get the Anderson to catch up. The seas were continued to build, and as you can see by the red arrow in the three, the wind had moved around. They had following seas, and eventually that would move around, so they would have uh, seas up their stern quarter, and almost broadside by the time the boat was lost around that number seven down close to Whitefish Bay. So they were in a heck of a storm being beaten up badly. The damage was getting worse on the Fitzgerald. The Anderson kept close contact with them, talking to them every 15 minutes or half hour. And finally, a little snow squall came between the two boats. And what that meant was back then the Anderson, their radar would look out and it would see snowflakes. So the radar screen just lit up like TV snow. They couldn't see the, the Fitzgerald ahead of them. About five or 10 minutes later, that cleared up, that had blown through. So they tried to find the Fitzgerald ahead of the Anderson again, and they couldn't find it. They called the boats in Whitefish Bay thinking, well, maybe the Fitzgerald had gotten in a little earlier. No, no one had come in, but three ocean boats had gone out. So they contacted the three ocean boats. Have you seen the Fitzgerald? And Captain Woodard, who was the pilot on the Ava Force, said that he had talked to Captain McSorley a little while earlier, said that he was uh, having some problems, but he was going along like an old shoe. So he was plodding through, lower in the water, um, but still moving along. No sense of real imminent danger. The Anderson still couldn't find him on the radar. He finally contacted Sault Ste. Marie, the Coast Guard there and there, they found that the Coast Guard at Sault Ste. Marie, as Cooper talked to them, they were busy with some small craft that were missing. Water had overtopped the gates at the Sioux Locks, so the Sioux Locks were shut down. They were just really busy, 
and had kind of other things to deal with. But if we think about this in some perspective, there had not been another uh, bulk crater like the Fitzgerald lost in Lake Superior since 1953. And now Captain Cooper is telling him he thinks the boat ahead of him took a nosedive. He didn't see it go down. He just can't find it on radar. So the Coast Guard talks and calls on the radio to the Fitzgerald, no answer, calls other boats, no one has seen the Fitzgerald. So finally, the Coast Guard asks Captain Cooper if he will go back and look. And you have to ask the question, where's the Big Mackinac? Well, the Big Mackinac was in the dry dock at Sturgeon Bay. The Naugatuck, the Coast Guard boat at stationed at Sault Ste. Marie, they were not seaworthy in waves in the upper part of the river above the locks and no way to get through the locks because the locks were closed because the waves were going over the top of them. And so Cooper was the closest they could get to go back out. Not only did Cooper go back out, the William Clay Ford pulled up anchor from Whitefish Bay, headed out in the storm. The Hoshalaga Canadian boat pulled up from Whitefish Bay, went out to search. And if we think about what they were searching for out there, where do you search? Cooper did not see the boat go down, so he didn't know whether they were 12 miles or 20 miles from Whitefish Point. He didn't know if they were east or west of the track line. He didn't know if the boat was still on the surface where they were looking for lifeboats. It's 7, 10 p.m. in November. It's really dark out. So this is not only searching for the needle in the haystack, it's trying to find the haystack first so you could do a decent search. Two boats that were above Isle Royal waiting out the storm was uh, one was the Roger Blau, 858 feet long, 105 feet wide. It's like a tank when it's coming down the lake. Very stable. They came down uh, to become part of the search, as did Captain Paquette's boat, the Wilfred Sykes. So again, these are the, the boats that are actually doing the search. The closest real Coast Guard search and rescue boat to be available was the Coast Guard Cutter Woodrush, 350 miles from the accident scene, stationed in Duluth, Minnesota. And they were able to get underway remarkably in about 45 minutes to an hour. When they got to the other end of the lake, when they turned on the searchlight, the first and only thing they found that night was a searchlight that floated off from the roof of the pilot house. And that's what you see in the top right of this photograph. It's a big searchlight. It's mostly hollow inside, even though it's aluminum on the outside. Um, it floated away from the wreck, part of the tons of flotsam. Also, we'll see dozens of life jackets here that were recovered. Uh, virtually all of the life rings were recovered, many covered in oil. There's some oily canvas here, gas bottles for the galley. This uh, wooden block here is called a fender block. Its real purpose is to be slipped down between the hull of the ship and a lock wall if someone falls overboard. They have that little space, about two feet, in which to dog paddle while someone is trying to get you out of the water. Again, life rings covered with oil uh, and all those life jackets. Eventually, lifeboats were recovered, both of the lifeboats. Um, this one says number two, uh, capable of handling 50 persons. This is another view of that, that same lifeboat, number two. The self-inflating life rafts were recovered. So tons of things were recovered. The wood rush is out there searching around and not having much luck either with things. And finally, everyone was called into Sault Ste. Marie to reorganize the search and to begin the, the process of investigation. Part of it started right away in November, the investigation. And then there was a, a delay until May when it resumed. And in May, the wood rush was in charge of this thing. It's called a Curve 3, C-U-R-V, Roman numeral three. It's cable controlled underwater recovery vehicle. They had located the wreck from the air. It needs a mothership, so the wood rush was pressed back into service, and they took it out over the wreck site where they thought there was the wreck site, sent it down underwater, and this is a thing about the size of an old Volkswagen Beetle, and they started to pick up wreckage. But it doesn't say if it's the Fitzgerald the pieces of twisted and torn steel. Here, the inside of a hatch cover. Some more twisted and torn steel. Here, a bulkhead light 
or was pushed out from the inside of the ship. And then they stumbled across this. And as they first looked at this, they were startled. They realized these letters are upside down. Yes, they spell Fitzgerald. Well, it turned out as they moved it around a little bit, they were looking at the name of the ship upside down on the stern, Edmund Fitzgerald registered in Milwaukee. So they knew exactly where they were on the ship. Just above this, you can see the stern anchor. So the thing to do would be to fly our underwater vehicle, our rove, uh, up over the top of the anchor, right down the keel of the ship, and we could look at the whole thing. So that's what they did. Flew up, started down the keel, went about 170 feet or so, and the boat ended. They came to a break in the hull. Then they started searching around for the rest of the wreck. Fortunately, it was nearby, so they got to see the whole wreck, but the two major pieces. Here they're up by the pilot house on the starboard side. In this case, they're at the front of the pilot house, looking into the windows just on the right, where the uh, life jacket is up on the ceiling, floating on the ceiling, is where the captain would be probably, and behind him, the, the, the steersman, wheelsman at the helm. This is just another view of that. And here we see what looks like an old car headlight there is a gyro compass repeater, so that whoever is standing at the window there could see the exact heading of the ship. And they moved around, they found a number of hatch combings, here we have the uh, hatch cover is missing. Here we see a combing with the number five on the inside. Here we see some hatch clamps that have been flipped open. In this case, we see a hatch clamp that may be a little twisted, but not nearly as twisted as this one is. They found so many hatch clamps that were open and undamaged that the Coast Guard later concluded that maybe those hatch clamps were not properly tightened or maybe weren't even in place, which seems unlikely when you know you're going to be sailing into a winter storm or a fall storm, fully loaded. Uh, all of those hatches are going to be clamped down. After all of the investigation, now we're trying to assemble this into what really happened. And so what caused the wreck of the Fitzgerald? It could be dozens of things many of which we can eliminate that just don't make sense uh, in this particular wreck. There are questions about the fabrication methods and the construction. We know that from Ray Ramsey. The quality of steel came up because the shipyard had been idle for decades, and then all of a sudden they have orders for three ships. We need the steel for three ships and we need it now. Stress fractures, which may have been from that wiggling thing the ship working in the storm and finally something breaks and a crack starts and it just continues to grow. Design flaws and untested design, that's a possibility, a strong possibility. So we had gone from 500 foot boats that had been design tested up to 730 feet, and this being the very first one with no real testing. Uh, this was in fact an untested design. No loading manual. Um, all of the ships have the, the loading manuals kind of in the, in the head of the first mate and his loading book. It tells how to load and unload the boat to, to cause the least amount of stress on the ship. Overloading the load lines and minimum freeboard. Remember, they changed the load lines three times during the boat's career. Its initial, initial cargo was for around 20,000 tons of cargo, and now it was carrying 26,000 tons. Instead of like 14 feet of freeboard, it had more like 11 feet. So it was much deeper in the water and carrying more cargo then. The Whitefish Point Lighthouse, which would have been important for Captain McSorley to know where he was out on the lake, that White, Whitefish Point light was out because of the storm disrupting the electrical lines to the lighthouse. There was no radio beacon there either for this same reason. The second column, severe weather. Of course, there was severe weather. Waves were up to 35 feet or sometimes higher. The wind was steady around 70, but gusts up over 100 miles per hour. And with those gusts up around 100 miles per hour, and especially in the area close to, to Whitefish Bay or Whitefish Point, we start to get backwash waves, waves hitting the shoreline and reflecting off 
coming back in a little different direction. And you can get waves there from three different directions at the same time. So those could make a difference. Shoaling near Caribou Island. Did the boat bottom out there? We don't know for sure. We just don't know. Things started to happen right in that area. The loose keel we talked about during construction and whether the outer skin of the ship on the inside was properly welded to the inside of the cargo bottom in the ship. The wiggling thing or kind of a galloping gertie. If you look up the gall galloping gertie on the internet, you'll see a, a bridge in uh, Tacoma, Washington that basically tears itself apart in the wind. What's going on and with this wiggling thing was that the boat would, in certain sea conditions, it would start to spring up and down and a little bit sideways and that it would it could get to a point where that would start to really build and get bigger and bigger it wouldn't settle down before the next wave hit and that became the wiggling thing and if there was a loose keel or ineffective welds that wiggling thing certainly would have stressed out those welds between the inside of the water bottom and the ballast tanks on the bottom of the ship so what we see now is a photo or illustration that was made for the newspaper showing the bow section right side up, stern section upside down. Here we see another drawing was made from the Coast Guard drawings that shows the debris field a little better off the stern and off the bow. Here we can see the Coast Guard drawing showing how close those pieces are. They're only 170 feet apart. And that's important because if the boat broke on the surface, these two pieces would be much further apart. One of those sections would have floated much longer than the other, and they would be separated quite a bit on the bottom. Here we see again two of the drawings of how the, the wreck sits on the bottom, made by the Coast Guard, again from the stern section, and then a composite that shows the two. And what I'm going to suggest is that the boat broke in two like a green stick, and that's what we see in the next uh, illustration. So what's going on is as we were going along, we're near Caribou Island, we started to develop that list. So we're leaning over to one side. We continue on and eventually two hatch covers cave in. We know because they're uh, shown in the drawings and photographs that these two hatch covers are open. The hatch covers or hatch openings are roughly 48 feet wide and about 12 feet fore and aft. So we've got two holes, 12 feet by 48 feet first two hatch covers at the front of the boat water is still boarding the ship that's sitting lower and lower in the water tons of water pours in really quick and as it does the front gets really heavy noses into a wave that it can't recover from and starts to go down meanwhile back here about two-thirds of the way back we have a place that's called a hinge um, or a stress concentration point it cracks across the deck part way down, and then on top of those tunnels, that stick bit built part, it starts to tear right along there. And that stern section now is dragging in the water. It comes off on the way down and gives a half turn, and the two pieces end up on the bottom, close to each other. The center piece of the deck stayed with the front, nothing to hold it up on the bottom, it just dropped down. The center piece of back end of the boat um, peel the bottom off as it rolled over and set this part down right there. And that's what I think happened. Years ago, I, I listened to a talk about the Edmund Fitzgerald and the person who was speaking said, um, in answer to what may have happened to the Fitzgerald, he said simply that there are a lot of reasons this ship is big enough for everyone's opinion. Whether we go to a faulty structure, faulty design, whatever, we know that the boat did not survive. We don't know to this day exactly what happened. Is it really a mystery? Yes, it's a mystery because we don't have that definitive answer. And yet we have reasons to believe certain things much more true than others. So thanks for being with us today and hope you'll do your own research on the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald.